to you a PowerPoint presentation which sets out the arguments for the belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, for many years I have been interested in what is called apologetics. Now, apologetics doesn't mean that you apologize, but I looked it up just so that I have a, sh a short definition. Apologetics is present the presentation of reasoned arguments or writings in justification of something, typically a theory or a religious doctrine. Now, you're doubtless all aware that there has been a prolonged assault since New Testament times on the resurrection as to whether Jesus, um, in fact, was killed, whether he really died and then rose from the dead. Um, I've done presentations on other things like, does God exist? If you have a, um, people who say, oh no, God doesn't exist can't be proved. I believe it can mathematically and I've got a very interesting one on that topic, does God exist? But this morning as I said it's on the resurrection. Now I realise of course that I'm speaking here to believers but doubtless some of you have families or friends who do not share your beliefs or faith. I hope that this presentation will help to clarify your minds the reasons for faith in the risen Saviour. Perhaps it will assist you in answering any questions that non-believers may put to you. You'll be aware that a huge percentage of people these days around us are not believers. Many are totally indifferent to what the Bible says, and I've met people, and perhaps you are, who are absolutely hostile to anything that they see as religious, especially even the mention of the name of Jesus. You may well be aware that throughout history a large number of clever, intelligent scholars with brilliant minds have spent years trying to, dis to disprove that Jesus physically rose from the dead. Towards the end of the presentation I will be considering several of the most famous attempts to disprove the resurrections with um, results which might surprise you. Finally, having said those things, please do not think that you're going to be bored out of your brain by a lot of heavy argument. I've put much thought and preparation into what you will see and hear, but you will be, you will be able to understand it. And it is my hope and prayer that you will be strengthened and greatly encouraged in your faith. If any of you came here with any doubts at all, I trust that you will realize in a new way that the case for the resurrection of Christ is amazingly strong and convincing. Now, is something else happening? No, you're, you're still on. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to begin with um, two Bible readings. The first is from, will be up on the screen, I understand, from the final chapter of Luke, Luke chapter 24. It's on, appropriately, the resurrection. Very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the grave carrying spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the entrance to the grave. So they went in, but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They stood there, puzzled about this, when suddenly two men in bright shining clothes stood by them. Full of fear, the women bowed down to the ground, as the men said to them, Why are you looking among the dead for one who is alive? He is not here. He has been raised. Remember what he said to you while he was in Galilee. The Son of Man must be handed over to sinful men, be nailed to the cross, and rise to life on the third day. Then the women remembered his words, returned from the grave, and told all these things to the eleven disciples, and all of the rest. 
The women were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the, mo the mother of James. They and the other women with them told these things to the apostles. But the apostles thought that what the women, women said was nonsense, and they didn't believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the grave. He bent down and saw the grave clothes and nothing else. Then he went back home wondering at what had happened. From the final chapter of Matthew, which gives some other details. After the Sabbath, as Sunday morning was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at, at the grave. Suddenly, there was a strong earthquake. An angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled the stone away, and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid that they trembled and became like dead men. The angel spoke to the women. You must not be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was nailed to the cross. He is not here. He has been raised, just as he said. Come here and see the place where he lay. Quickly, now, go and tell his disciples. He has been raised from death, and now he is going to Galilee ahead of you, and there you will see him. Remember what I have told you. So, they left the grave in a hurry, afraid and yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, Peace be with you. They came up to him, took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Do not be afraid, Jesus said to them. Go and tell my brothers and go to Galilee and there they will see me. Now there are two of us who are going to be working. I'll be doing the actual presentation and it's over to Lou who hasn't seen this before and it's fairly difficult to do what I've asked him to do but who will be moving the, the images. Like the first image of the, Lord, of the Lord Jesus. Right, here we start. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Fact or fiction? History or hoax? Did Jesus rise from the dead? Why is it really important? If Jesus rose from the dead, how does it affect me? Was this the end? Or did this become this, the resurrected Lord? I should just explain that there is not a, a sort of a, a, an even distribution of the images. Sometimes they come together like that and then sometimes they don't. Proceeding. When, over 200 years ago, Napoleon was striking fear into the hearts of millions, there was a well-known French bishop known as Mar Charles Maurice de Talleyrand. The bishop was a cripple, but he had a huge impact on his times. He had a friend named Monsieur Le Pau, whose idea it was to start a new religion one which would be better than Christianity. For some reason, Monsieur Le Pau's ideas just didn't catch on. So he asked Bishop Talleyrand how he could popularize his new religion. Talleyrand thought about it for a moment and then said to him, Monsieur Le Pau, I have a plan. Why not get yourself crucified and then rise again on the third day? Now I want you to imagine for a few moments that I came into the room and said, Ladies and gentlemen, I know that I'm going to die next week. 
I'm going to be killed in 10 days' time. It'll be on a Friday. A small group of violent men will attack me and I will die. Now, if that actually happened, I suspect you wouldn't quite know how to react to my announcement. You might have a hard time taking me seriously. Then suppose I said, oh, but there's no need to worry, ladies and gentlemen. Please don't be too alarmed because that's not going to be the end. Three days after I am brutally murdered, I am going to come back to life. You will see me again, alive and well, up and about. Now I want you to imagine that I really did make those two predictions. Think about it for a moment. You'd probably think that I should be put in an institution that I'd lost my marbles or that I'd gone mad, mm -hmm. totally out of my brain, or that I was dreaming. Why? Our everyday experience tells us that dead people do not come back to life. Yet, Jesus predicted on several occasions that he would be crucified and then rise from the grave three days later. We have become so accustomed to hearing the Easter message and all about the resurrection that it's hard for us to understand the impact Jesus' announcements must have had on his disciples. They had difficulty digesting his words, but in the case of Jesus, his words came true. One of the amazing things about Jesus Christ is that his death is even more important than his life. In most biographies, the person's death is referred to in the last chapter or two. But in the Gospels, the death of Jesus is central. Nearly half of what is written relates to his death in one way or another. All but four of the major religions in our world are based on mere philosophical propositions, you know, thoughts. But the four that are based on personalities rather than a philosophical system, only one claims an empty tomb for its founder. Abraham, the father of Judaism, died in about 1900 B.C., no resurrection was ever claimed for him. His bones lie buried in Palestine. How about Buddha? The accounts of his death say that he died, quoting, with that utter passing away in which nothing whatever remains behind. And what of the prophet Muhammad, who died on June the 8th, 1632, at Medina, he was 61. His tomb is visited annually by many thousands of devout Mohammedans or Muslims. All the millions of Jews, Buddhists and Muslims, the followers of the Islam, of the Islam religion agree that their founders have never come out of the dust of the earth in resurrection. Not so with Jesus Christ. The most common and orthodox position among Christians has always been that Christianity rises or falls with the resurrection of Christ. It is of fundamental, critical importance. And so I'm going to focus for a few minutes on a death that achieved everything. During the three years that he was with his disciples, Jesus spoke to them on several occasions about his approaching death. He told them that he had come to earth to die, to become an offering for the sins of the world, for instance, in the Gospel of Matthew we read, Jesus said he would be betrayed by a friend, 
condemned to death, scourged by the soldiers, mocked by the scribes, crucified by the Roman soldiers. But his disciples and followers had seen him performing miracles. They had watched him walk on the waters of Lake Galilee. In awe, they had seen him calm a violent storm and raise dead people to life. So, somehow, when Jesus told them that he would have to suffer and die at the hands of religious rulers, the words just didn't sink in. They could not imagine that such things could happen to this man, their leader. They just did not get it. On the other hand, his enemies, the scribes and the Pharisees, took his words very seriously. Jesus had denounced their hypocrisy and exposed their sins too often for their comfort, and they wanted him out of the way. They too had seen his miracles and were afraid that his words about rising from the dead might come true. So, as a precautionary measure, just in case, they urged Pilate to place a special seal over the tomb where his body lay and to set a guard of soldiers outside to make sure the body stayed in the grave. But when Jesus was arrested and taken away that night, his closest followers were totally unprepared. They were frightened. They were disillusioned. They acted like cowards. In fear, they took to their heels and ran away. Only one of them, Peter, was there at the trial before Pilate. And Peter, as you know, strenuously denied that he even knew Jesus. The following day, the day we call Good Friday, some of Jesus' friends were there watching as Jesus had to carry his own cross up Mount Calvary. Helpless, they stood by as the nails were driven into his hands and feet. They saw the horror of that ghastly scene. They heard the crowd jeer and laugh and hurl abuse at him. They stood there, eleven confused, defeated men, frightened, bewildered, humiliated. They stood there too as an unnatural darkness overshadowed the land, and finally, when Jesus had paid the price for sin, they heard him call out in a loud voice, It is finished. They saw him bow his head and give up his spirit. The disciples were in a state of shock, total bewilderment. This was the one in whom they had placed such hope. Now he was dead, defeated, or so they thought. Somehow they had forgotten that this man Jesus had tried to tell them all this must happen, that it was part of God's plan. His words, I am the resurrection and the life, and on the third day I will rise again, had escaped them completely. They forgot that he claimed to be older than time and greater than death. A small band of women were at the foot of the cross. Among them were the two Marys. They were there as the body was taken down from the cross. They were there to prepare his body for burial. They were amongst the last to leave the crucifixion scene and the first to arrive at the tomb. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The Sabbath is now over. It is Sunday, 
very early in the morning. Remember, they expect an encounter, an encounter with a corpse. They walk there sadly, solemnly, expecting to anoint the body with spices. The two Marys are about to pay their final respects to their Lord. Peter hadn't volunteered, nor had any of the other men. Just the two women. Who will roll away the stone for us, they ask. They think they are there alone, that their journey is unnoticed. But God sees. He watches them walk up the mountain. He sees their devotion, and he has a surprise waiting for them. Reading from Matthew 28. At that time there was a strong earthquake. An angel of the Lord came down from heaven, went to the tomb, and rolled the stone away from the entrance. Then he sat on the stone. He was shining bright as lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The soldiers guarding the tomb shook with fear because of the angel, and they became like dead men. Now, why did the angel move that stone? It wasn't, as people might suppose, to let Jesus out of the tomb. Listen to what the angel says to the women. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said he would. Come and see the place where his body was lying. Jesus had already risen. The stone was moved not to let Jesus out, but to let the women see in. Then the angel said, Go quickly and tell his disciples, Jesus has risen from the dead. He is going to Galilee ahead of you. You will see him there. The women didn't have to be told twice. They turn and start running to Jerusalem. The darkness has gone. The sun is up. The sun is out. But Jesus, the sun, has another surprise for them. Matthew tells us, Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. The women came up to him, took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go and tell my followers to go on to Galilee, and they will see me there. I suspect something happens when you see someone who has risen from the dead. The women saw him and were thrilled. The soldiers saw him and were terrified. Roman soldiers had been ordered to guard the tomb, ordered to make sure the body stayed in, and he was gone. The soldiers knew what to expect, punishment by the sword. Listen again to what Matthew says. While the women were going, their hearts were filled with awe and great joy. Some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests everything that had happened. The elders consulted together and gave the soldiers a considerable money, a, sorry, a considerable sum of money and told them, you are to say his disciples came after dark and stole the body away while you were asleep. If by any chance this reaches the governor's ears, we will put it right with him and see that you do not suffer for it. So they took the money and obeyed their instructions. The story was spread and is current among Jews to this day. Fancy that. They stole the body while we were asleep. Does that need comment? But it was the best thing the Jewish leaders could come up with at that time in the morning, and so they resorted to bribery. The soldiers knew what had happened. The religious rulers believed the soldiers 
but they did not want the true facts to be spread. Jesus had risen. Five of the women had seen him and touched him. Jesus asked them to go and tell the news to the others. They did, but the disciples were still afraid of the Jewish leaders, so they met behind closed doors. We, re we need to remember that these disciples were so devastated by what had happened to Jesus that they were a band of defeated cowards. They had all run away when their master was arrested. They were <coughs> utterly disillusioned and fearful, disenchanted, disillusioned, despondent, despairing, downcast, defeated, and dismayed. That is, until something happened. An astonishing change was to come over the disciples in the space of a few days. Question. How was it that these disciples, in just a few days, were totally transformed, completely changed? What was the reason? Why did it happen? What made the difference? Answer. They all met the resurrected, triumphant Jesus. They saw his hands where the nails had been. They saw his side where the spear had pierced him. When the disciples saw the risen Lord, they were astonished, overjoyed. One day, cowering behind closed doors, then, as Jesus appeared to them in the following days, they were transformed into a company that no persecution could silence. And once convinced, once assured that he was alive, they never doubted again. Friday, at the crucifixion, they were without hope. Saturday, in despair. But on Sunday and the days immediately following, their hearts glowed with certainty. As Peter said, we beheld his glory. James, Jesus' own brother, had been a total skeptic. Before the resurrection, James despised all that Jesus stood for. Perhaps he thought his brother was blackening their family name. But after James had seen Jesus alive again, he was out preaching with the other disciples that Jesus had risen from the dead. What about Thomas? He saw Jesus. He saw where the spear had wounded Jesus' side and declared, my Lord and my God. Saul of Tarsus, he had thought that Jesus was a fake or a false messiah, a blasphemer. His passion was to exterminate these believers. But then, in that famous account, Jesus himself met Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, and the result was overwhelming. The New Testament gives a dozen accounts of Jesus appearing to his followers. As late as the year AD 56, first century, Saul, completely changed and now called Paul, noted that over 500 believers had seen the risen Jesus and that most of them were still alive. An incredible change came over them when they met the living Jesus they were totally, absolutely transformed. They now had new zeal, a new power. They now knew Jesus was alive. They wanted the world to know. I said earlier that something happens to a man when he witnesses someone who has risen from the death. 
Something stirs within the soul of a man when he has stood within inches of God. Their message was, He is risen. They could not be silenced. They lived for it. They were prepared to die for it. And most of the original band of disciples did. But the whole of the Roman Empire was unable to shake their testimony or stem the tide of their enthusiasm. As one historian has written, it is a startling discovery to find that 50 years after Jesus died on the gallows of Rome, there was a church reared for his worship in every principle of the Roman Empire. Now, up till now, I have presented the account as it's found in the Bible. You can read it for yourself. Question. Is the story reliable? Would the evidence stand in a court of law? Can you and I trust the biblical account? Are we to believe all this or not? And what are the implications for each of us? Now at this point I could have gone through the various theories that have been suggested by skeptics to try to prove that the resurrection didn't happen. I could have told you about the kidnap theory, the swoon theory, all that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross, and so on. But I'm, instead, I thought it would be far more compelling to have much more authority if I took a different approach. I would like now to tell you briefly about four cases of really brilliant people who have studied the evidence closely meticulously and have drawn their own conclusions. Allow me to call the first witness to the stand. His name, Professor Thomas Arnold, the celebrated headmaster of Rugby Grammar School in England, a professor of history at Oxford University and author of a famous three-volume History of Rome. He was devoted to studying historical documents and weighing evidence. He wrote this, Thousands and tens of thousands of persons have gone through the evidence piece by piece as carefully as any judge summing up on a most important cause. I have done it many times over, not to persuade others, but to satisfy myself and... I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is proved by better and fuller evidence of every sort. My next witness possessed an exceptionally brilliant mind. Legal scholars still consider his three-volume work a treatise on the law of evidence to be the greatest single authority on evidence in the entire literature of legal procedure. Chief Justice Fuller of the United States Supreme Court said, he is the highest authority on our courts. Almost single-handed, this man wrote the entire American Constitution. He was also one of the principal founders of the famous Harvard Law School. His name was Simon Greenleaf. Simon Greenleaf. He started out to disprove, I said disprove, the resurrection. He thought it was a myth and it would not stand thorough investigation. This great legal scholar began to study the New Testament documents which he subjected to rigorous cross-examination. As he did, he changed his mind. He came to an undoubting conviction in their integrity and truth. He wrote, These are no ordinary claims, but they demand our cordial belief as a matter of vital concern. I'm nearly through. <laughs> My third witness was an extraordinary man. 
His name was Lionel Macou. Lionel Macou. He was undoubtedly one of the greatest lawyers in British history. He was listed in, I've seen it, the, for 18 years, the Guinness Book of Records as the most, the world's most successful legal, sorry, hold on, um, let's do that again. The world's most successful advocate. Why? Because he conducted 245 consecutive murder trials and he gained 245 acquittals. That is staggering. Not one conviction for murder. No other defence lawyer has come close to that record. In addition, he was knighted twice by Queen Elizabeth II, and on two other occasions he was decorated by Her Majesty the Queen. He had the distinction of being the only man in history ever to be the ambassador of two sovereign nations at the one time. He had two coats of arms and two flags flew from his car. In addition to this, he was High Commissioner to London, to Paris, to Bonn in Germany, and The Hague in Holland. He was also the Mayor of Georgetown, Guyana, and at one time the head of four trade unions. He was wealthy and owned a large string of racehorses. In his spare time, Lionel Coup was a newspaper columnist, the author of several books, and a radio journalist. He was quite a man. In spite of his fame, his success, and his wealth, he felt empty inside. The older he got, the more meaningless life appeared. It wasn't until he was 63 years of age that he began to study the Bible. He turned his analytical skills to investigate the claim that Jesus rose from the dead. This was his conclusion. I say unequivocally that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming it compels acceptance by proof which leaves absolutely no room for, dark, for doubt. He found that the message of Jesus, the knowledge that he rose from the dead, satisfied his spiritual hunger and his intellectual questioning. He says, as he followed Jesus, that he found peace. Becoming a Christian made an enormous impact on Lionel Nahu. He gave up his comfortable and very lucrative law practice to spend the rest of his life traveling the world spreading the good news that Jesus is alive. I should mention briefly other men like Lee Strobel. I've got about six of his books. Lee Strobel, the famous Yale educated journalist and atheist, atheist, who planned to shoot down the resurrection accounts. He studied the New Testament with one purpose, to show once and for all that Jesus did not rise from the grave. As he studied, his opinions changed totally and he became a keen Christian. You can put his name and you can hear him talking, by the way, on uh, the internet. Lee Strobel has written several books about the risen Christ. And there are men like Frank Morrison, author of a famous book, Who Moved the Stone? This book influenced many and topped the bestsellers list. He too started off sceptical, totally sceptical, thinking the resurrection of Jesus was what he called a fairy tale. Careful investigation of the biblical story resulted in a total about-face for him. He started off to shoot down the story and read and ended up writing quite another book, Who Moved the Stone, which became a bestseller. Well, who did move the stone? The soldiers guarding the tomb knew. Jesus had risen from the dead. He was alive again. Look in the tomb. He's gone. He is risen. 
Christ is alive forevermore. Jesus said, I have power to lay my life down and to take it up again. He did. Jesus said, I will come again. He will. Have you responded to him? In conclusion, I've provided details of just a few very brilliant men who have closely analysed and searched the biblical accounts. There are, as Thomas Arnold said 200 years ago, tens of thousands of others. I submit to you that any unbiased, unprejudiced person who genuinely wishes to know the truth about Jesus Christ will come to a similar conclusion. He died and rose again. Tens of millions of people on earth today claim to have a real living relationship with this man right now. His message has not changed. He still offers us a free pardon and to all who will trust him. The conditions have not changed. The first step is still to be willing to turn away from our way of doing things, in other words, to humbly seek his forgiveness and to follow him. The reward hasn't changed either. Peace in this life, as well as the certainty of eternal life in heaven with him. I believe that nothing, nothing in this world is more important than to be sure of that. Let me conclude by reminding you of some important words Jesus said. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He claimed to be the only one who could take us to heaven. I believe him. Do you? I've asked that we have the hymn, He Lives.